And we'll get more into why this perspective that you're bringing this, this kind of nuance of the conversation is, is good and helpful. But I, I think a lot of us have experienced the Reformation being presented differently, where it is this new, innovative, uh, kind of a back to the drawing board mentality about, Christ, about the Christian faith. How did that happen? Uh, is that just from oversimplifications of, of yeah. presenting church history? And, and so in what ways has the Protestant Reformation been misunderstood, even by those who would uh, consider themselves to be Reformed? Yeah, I, I think you're on to something there. It, it has been misunderstood. And unfortunately, we've sometimes perpetuated some of these narratives. They come in different forms and different sizes and shapes and for different reasons. Uh, I, I, there's, there's a lot of history to this backstory. Uh, for example, uh, if, you, if you go back to, say, uh, even the 16th century itself, well, the, it, it was not lost on the reformers, this accusation that they were innovators. Uh, that accusation did not sit well with them. In fact, they tried to show just the opposite. Uh, however, even to this day, uh, you will hear in polemics uh, with Protestants and Roman Catholics that that charge will still be thrown around. Um, what's peculiar about that the, that type of uh, mindset is how it makes its way within an evangelical context, and I think one of the reasons that sometimes happens is there's a bit of a swinging of the pendulum, if I can put it that way. In other words. In an effort to to really uh, show how we are different as a Protestant from a Roman Catholic per se, uh, we can, in a good emphasis on one thing, uh, assume then that to be Protestant means there is a complete discontinuity, right, on everything else. And one way we can remedy that is to simply recognize well. The polemics of the 16th century were very specific. It, they, they were not debating about everything. Um, Richard Muller, uh, one of the great historians of our generation, has said this really well. He has said when it comes to, say, uh, the exact nature of justification, uh, when it comes to, say, uh, transubstantiation, or uh, the authority of the papacy. Well, certainly these are examples where there is fierce debate, and there needs to be. But those are very specific. Um, on the majority of other Christian doctrines, the reformers were silent, not not because they were in disagreement, but precisely because there was no debate to be had, uh, especially in matters of orthodoxy. Uh, mm -hmm. That's a helpful correction because... Uh, when certain radicals in the 16th century uh, went too far and started to reinvent the wheel, not paying attention to the past, uh, it could be the doctrine of the Trinity, it could be Christology, it could be the doctrine of the church. Uh, well, the magisterial reformers hit the brakes hard at that point and said, uh, no, you, you are uh, moving us way beyond matters of reform. These are matters... Uh, of Christian orthodoxy on which there is no debate. So that's an important clarification. I think, you know, some of our, so, to some of the listeners, if you're reformed in particular, uh, I am, uh, this too is an important emphasis, right? Because we can sometimes forget that, well, we, we can sometimes give the impression that to be reformed is somehow antithetical with Catholicity. And I think the Reformed tradition of the 16th and 17th centuries uh, would find that very puzzling because uh, they understood themselves as Reformed. They, they, they understood themselves as adhering to a Reformed Catholicity. They did not see those two things as opposed to one another. Let me put it this way, if that's confusing. Uh, they saw themselves as Catholic with a small C, but not Roman. That's the difference. Right. And so yeah. uh, for that reason, I, I, 
there's all kind. There's a whole, we could go into a lot of reasons why that disappears, but I think it's really key to return that emphasis so that we don't misunderstand our own identity. Um, I'll leave it at that. There are other reasons, though. Um, uh, there's a, a popular narrative out there that uh, oftentimes will uh, blame the Reformation for uh, the modernism and schism that came after it with the Enlightenment and everything after the Enlightenment. And I think sometimes as Protestants, we haven't had an answer for that charge. And be, because we have not had an answer, uh, sometimes it can uh, come across as if, well, to hold to sola scriptura then means that we're individualists. And right. uh, well, that's exactly where the Enlightenment went. Or that uh, we've completely severed uh, the, the cord of participation so that um, we just merely focus on what's external and we have no appreciation for for God's real presence in this world. And and sometimes those caricatures are perpetuated to this day. And and oftentimes I find Protestants don't know what to say. And, and so we just get we we give them more credence than they should have. Yeah. And it, and it is a caricature, but uh, it's a caricature for a reason. I think lots of times <laughs> uh, us reform folks can operate uh uh, something closer to solo scriptura rather than the solo scriptura, and rather seeing scripture as our ultimate authority, uh, it's seen as as the only authority, which is to say that we can learn nothing from the church as a whole, you know, uh, church ages of the past and these councils and these creedal, and, and we don't want to fall into that either. And, and so I think our own tendencies have maybe given more ammunition then is helpful to that claim that uh, there is this kind of a jettisoning uh, of of history and tradition, and there ought not to be. There's lots of things that can be uh, retained and, and things that can be pointed to. And as you mentioned, the reformers had to do this in their own time. They're being accused of schism- uh, being accused of being schismatics. Yeah. They're still accused of being schismatics, and so in their own day, how is it that they are pushing back against that? that claim. You mentioned that they're appealing to Augustine and Bernard. What are they doing to try and say, no, uh, it's called a reformation for a reason. We're reforming what's already there. We're not starting over. Yeah. Well, they're doing a lot (laughs) to put it, put it very uh, bluntly. Uh, That's where, you know, my book uh, is, is good size (laughs) because I'm trying to You just scared everyone away. Yeah, I, I'm I'm trying to, to take a lot of time and go to to visit each corner of the Reformation and let the reader see for themselves. So we go to Wittenberg, we go to Geneva, we, we go to England to visit uh, Cranmer and John Jewell and uh, John Fox and and. We go to Zurich to look at Zwingli and Bollinger and many, many others. Um, why do we do that? Because uh, I want I want readers to see with their own eyes and to hear with their own ears what the reformers have to say, not just to take my word for it. So as big as the book is, and <clears throat> in many ways, it's, ba- it's, it's very much an introduction so that readers can go do more of this themselves. Now, there's many examples. So I, I mentioned the English Reformation. That, that might be a good example because you take a figure like Thomas Cranmer. Isn't it interesting? Uh, Cranmer, here's, a, here's an incredible opportunity. I mean, the man lives long enough somehow, miraculously, to survive uh, <laughs> the brutal uh, reign of Henry uh, he lives long enough to see Edward come to come to the throne, and uh, with these transitions uh, are some real opportunities to make headway on reform. But Cranmer doesn't, like you said, he he's not tr- he's not attempting to do something new, so much as he's he is doing something quite ancient. It's not to say that that uh, you know there's nothing. Um, you know, fresh and in, in his reform, but it is to say that everything from the the vernacular Bible to the Book of Common Prayer uh, to some of the homilies 
uh, and so much more. So many of these reforming measures by Cramer are an attempt to put English uh, reformers in touch with their patristic roots, for example. And so uh, if you look at the, the beautiful language, language that he uses uh, in, in, say, the Book of Common Prayer, you'll, you'll notice this. Uh, there, there's echoes here of the church fathers for a reason. <music>